behaviorism and structural linguistics. Early theories in second language acquisition focused on the role of imitation in habit formation and language learning. Behaviorist theories, such as the contrastive analysis hypothesis, posited that the key to learning a second language was to identify the differences between the learner's first language and the target language, and then to drill the learner in those differences until they became automatic. Structural linguistics, another early theory in SLA, focused on the structure of language and how it could be analyzed and compared. This theory emphasized the importance of understanding the underlying rules and patterns of a language in order to learn it effectively. Both behaviorism and structural linguistics had a significant impact on the study of SLA, laying the groundwork for later research by highlighting the importance of factors such as practice, feedback, and meaningful communication in language learning. The theory and its constructs. Behaviorism is a theory that explains animal and human behavior. It aims to describe behavior without considering internal processes or mental events. Instead, it argues that behavior is determined solely by external factors in the environment. One of the most famous studies in behaviorism is Pavlov's experiments with dogs. Many experts view this research as the beginning of modern behaviorism. In one experiment, Pavlov sounded a tone every time he fed the dogs. After a few repetitions, the dogs began to associate the sound with food and would start salivating when they heard the tone, even when no food was present. This is called classical conditioning. The idea is that two events are naturally connected, and then a third event is introduced. After several repetitions, the association of the third event alone can trigger the response. Behaviorists argued that the same is true for human behavior. For example, they suggested that if a child cries and is picked up by a caregiver, the child will learn to cry to summon the caregiver. If the cry brings no response, the child will stop crying. This emphasis on association is a fundamental aspect of behaviorism. Frequency is another important factor in behaviorism. Each time a response is made to a stimulus, the association between them is strengthened. If the organism no longer receives the stimulus, the response behavior is expected to weaken, a process called extinction. Repeated exposure is thus an essential factor in developing new behaviors. Behaviorists also propose the concept of operant or behavioral conditioning. This is a feedback system in which reinforcement and punishment can induce an organism to engage in new behaviors. For example, chickens can learn to dance, pigeons to bowl, and people to speak new languages. In operant conditioning, an organism can be conditioned to engage in a behavior even when the stimulus is no longer present if it has learned the relevant association through consistent feedback. Behaviorists contended that mental processes were not involved in this process. It was purely a result of the association of events, a response to environmental stimuli and subsequent reinforcement or punishment. These are both responses to the response. Reinforcement encourages continuation of the response behavior, whereas punishment discourages continuation of the response. Within behaviorism, all learning, including language learning, is seen as the acquisition of a new behavior. Learning consists of developing responses to environmental stimuli. If these responses receive positive reinforcement, they will be repeated. If the responses receive punishment, they will be abandoned. A child learns a language by imitating sounds and structures that she hears in the environment. If she produces an utterance that brings a positive response, she is likely to do so again. If there is no response or a negative response, repetition is less probable. Thus, language learning is seen as similar to any other kind of learning, from multiplication to yodeling, imitation of models in the input, practice of the new behavior, and the provision of appropriate feedback. According to this theory, second language acquisition occurs in a similar fashion. To learn a second language, one must imitate correct models repeatedly. Learning of novel forms can also occur through analogy. For example, learners of English can acquire plural marking on nouns by analogy to previously learned forms, duck, ducks, cat, cats. Positive reinforcement of accurate imitations and correction of inaccurate imitation facilitates the learning process. The salient characteristic of SLA that differentiates it from child language learning is that L2 learners already know a first language, which must be overcome in the process of acquiring a second language. This process is difficult, but can be facilitated by appropriate instruction. Ideal learning conditions include plentiful and accurate models and immediate and consistent feedback. Such a position has clear consequences for L2 instruction. Learners should be exposed to a large number of target examples of language. They should imitate these models repeatedly and receive appropriate feedback, positive feedback for accurate imitations and correction of inaccurate ones. This process should be repeated until these behaviors have become automatic and error-free. Behaviorism was not the only impetus behind this approach to language learning and teaching. 
It was closely linked to structural linguistics, which offered a compatible theory of language. Structural linguistics presented language as based on a finite set of predictable patterns. Language could be analyzed as a series of building blocks, beginning from the sound system all the way to sentence structure. The goal of structural linguistics was careful description. Explanation was not within the purview of linguistics, because structural linguistics portrayed language as based on a discrete and finite set of patterns. It blended easily with behaviorism, which viewed learning as the acquisition of a discrete set of behaviors. Thus, combining the insights of behaviorism and structural linguistics, applied linguistics at this time viewed an L2 learner's task as the imitation and internalization of these patterns. Behaviorism offered several constructs, such as conditioning, reinforcement, and punishment, which remain important today. Some of these constructs have specific applications to SLA. As we have noted, the acquisition of an L2 was seen as the acquisition of a new set of behavior, a process that was obstructed by the L1. The L1 had to be overcome in order for SLA to be successful. Obviously, SLA is not always immediately, or even ultimately, successful. This lack of success was blamed in part on transfer, an important construct in SLA at that time, one with direct behaviorist roots. Transfer was said to occur when learners relied on the L1 used in attempting to produce the L2. Transfer can have either beneficial or negative consequences, depending on the distance between the L1 and L2. These differences were determined via contrastive analysis. This tool was used to compare languages, structure by structure, and sound by sound, to predict learner difficulty. Wherever languages were similar, it was predicted that there would be positive transfer. That is, learners would have little difficulty because they would simply be able to use their old habits in a new context. If the two languages were different or two seemingly comparable structures were different, negative transfer was predicted, resulting in learner difficulty and error. This type of transfer is often referred to as interference, another important construct. The L1 was seen as interfering with the acquisition of L2 structures. Thus, errors were seen as evidence of lack of learning, primarily the result of L1 interference. An important goal of language teaching was to help learners avoid these interference errors, lest they become ingrained. Repetition of correct models as well as immediate and consistent correction were seen as the best way to eradicate errors and facilitate language learning. There are several important implications of this position. First, the L1, and specifically, the extent of the difference between it and the target language, was considered the primary source of learner difficulty and error. This leads to a second significant implication. Difference is related to difficulty. Where the L1 and L2 differ only slightly, relatively little difficulty would be expected. Where the contrast between the two languages is greater, greater difficulty, and, consequently, more error would be predicted. The consequences for language teaching were also clear. Provision of correct models, massive repetition without learner reflection, avoidance of error, and provision of consistent feedback. Monitor theory. One of the most ambitious and influential theories in the field of second language acquisition is monitor theory, developed by Stephen Krashen in the 1970s and early 1980s. It was the first theory specifically developed for SLA and has been particularly influential among practitioners. Moreover, it has laid the foundation for important ideas in contemporary SLA theories. Its broader success is partly due to its relevance to the experiences of language learners and teachers. Understanding this theory is crucial to understanding the field of SLA theory and research as a whole. Monitor theory was the first to attempt to explain a variety of phenomena in language learning, such as the impact of age on SLA and the uneven effects of instruction. Unlike behaviorism, it proposes a language-specific model of language learning. However, the actual processes involved in learning are not explained, so labeling it a theory of learning may be somewhat overstated. Although not explicitly stated in Krashen's writing, monitor theory seems to be connected to Chomsky's theory of language, which suggests that humans have a unique faculty for language acquisition. According to this theory, much of what we consider linguistic knowledge is part of our biological makeup. In other words, children come to the task of language already knowing a great deal. They simply need the right input data for language acquisition to occur. Krashen maintains that a similar process occurs in SLA, suggesting that child and SLA processes are fundamentally similar. In monitor theory, the main driving force behind any type of language acquisition is the comprehension of meaningful messages and the interaction of the linguistic information in those messages with the innate language acquisition faculty. According to Krashen, Monitor theory can explain why not everything that is taught is learned, why not everything learned has been taught, and how individual differences among learners and learning contexts are related to the variable outcome of second language acquisition. 
monitor theory is comprised of five interrelated hypotheses which are based on several important constructs, key concepts that are inferred but not directly observable. The acquisition learning hypothesis. Monitor theory's most important hypothesis is the acquisition learning distinction. According to Krashen, acquisition and learning are two distinct ways of gaining knowledge. They are stored separately once obtained. Acquisition happens naturally and outside of awareness, emerging spontaneously when learners engage in normal interaction in the L2, where the focus is on meaning. Instruction and the intention to learn are unnecessary. Learners use acquired unconscious knowledge and spontaneous language use, making SLA similar to first language acquisition. Learners cannot articulate this knowledge and operate by feel instead of by rule. Learning, on the other hand, involves gaining explicit knowledge about language rules and patterns. It occurs when the L2 is the object of instruction, but not necessarily the medium. This knowledge is conscious and requires effortful processes that are undertaken intentionally. The acquired system and the learned system, however, cannot interact and the knowledge gained through learning cannot be converted into acquired knowledge. This is why learners may know grammar rules but may be unable to use them in spontaneous production. Conversely, a learner may use a structure accurately and spontaneously yet be unable to verbalize the rule for its use. This phenomenon is familiar to both learners and teachers, making the theory an intuitively appealing one. In monitor theory, formal grammar study will not enable learners to draw on that knowledge in spontaneous communication because it has not been acquired. Krashen argues that the effects of formal instruction on SLA, including feedback on errors, are peripheral. Instead, pedagogical approaches should focus on providing copious input and the opportunity for meaningful interaction. The acquisition learning distinction is the central hypothesis in monitor theory. The monitor hypothesis. Within monitor theory, learned knowledge serves primarily to edit acquired knowledge during language production. Essentially, learners can draw on this knowledge when they have sufficient time to consult their rule knowledge, such as in an untimed writing assignment. Krashen argues that this is only likely to occur, however, when the task requires the learner to pay attention to accuracy, as would be the case in a fill-in-the-blank exercise. Although these types of activities are relatively unimportant in overall language use and arguably only resemble language-related behavior, the usefulness of learned knowledge within monitor theory is negligible. Therefore, it is not worth spending valuable instructional time on developing it, as is typically the case in L2 classrooms. The natural order hypothesis. As previously noted, research on both first and second language acquisition has shown that learners follow specific sequences in acquiring certain forms, such as the grammatical morphemes ing, ed, s, and others. Additionally, they seem to progress through predictable stages in their understanding of grammatical structures, such as questions, negation, and relative clauses. These findings have been taken as evidence for the natural order hypothesis. At the end of this section, we present a study on the natural order, which suggests that these orders are independent of instructional sequences or even the complexity of the structures being acquired. For instance, while the third-person singular S ending in English may seem relatively straightforward, it has proven challenging for L2 learners, even those with advanced proficiency. Monitor theory posits that these patterns arise because all language acquisition is guided by the innate language acquisition faculty. The input hypothesis, according to monitor theory, humans can only learn language by understanding messages in the L2 or through comprehensible input, which is a central construct in the theory. The input hypothesis refers to this aspect of monitor theory. Comprehensible input refers to input that contains language that is slightly beyond the learner's current level of proficiency. Krashen introduces two more constructs in defining comprehensible input, I, defined as the learner's current level of proficiency, and I plus one, defined as a level just beyond the learner's current level. Krashen considers I plus one input as the most valuable data for SLA. While it is unclear in monitor theory exactly what one is or how it or I is identified, the precise definitions of these levels of input are unimportant since they are never isolated from the general input. According to Krashen, Providing input that is just above the learner's current level will offer several levels of input, including I, I plus 1, and possibly I1 and I plus 2. Therefore, as long as a teacher or native speaker does not speak too quickly or use overly complex language with a low-level learner, the presence of comprehensible input is likely. Learners will naturally access and use what they need, which allows acquisition to occur spontaneously as long as they are exposed to rich and comprehensible input. This is most likely to happen when communication consistently focuses on meaning instead of form. According to this theory, instruction on grammatical rules is of little use, and production activities are not essential for acquisition, but rather a result of it. 
Forcing learners to produce language before they are ready may even inhibit the acquisition process by taking their focus away from comprehending and processing input. Krashen suggests that a combination of rich input and the language acquisition faculty is all that is needed to promote successful language acquisition. In fact, he claims that comprehensible input is not only a necessary condition for SLA, but also a sufficient one. In the presence of comprehensible input, SLA is inevitable. The Effective Filter Hypothesis It's crucial for learners to feel at ease and receptive in their learning environment. Krashen introduced the idea of the effective filter to describe this. Learners who have a positive attitude towards language learning and are comfortable have a lower effective filter. This allows them to have full access to understandable input. Conversely, a stressful environment, such as one where learners are compelled to produce before they're ready, raises the effective filter, blocking the learner's input processing. Krashen believes that the effective filter can clarify the inconsistent outcome of SLA among L2 learners, involving differences in age and classroom conditions. Most of the evidence supporting the theory is indirect. Krashen mainly relies on general evidence to support his theory. For instance, he pointed to the positive results of language immersion programs and the mediocre results of foreign language instruction in the United States at that time as evidence of the crucial role of understandable input and the minor impact of direct instruction. He cited studies in which students who received massive amounts of understandable input through pleasure reading outperformed those who received traditional grammar-based instruction, as well as individual learners in acquisition-poor environments who failed to acquire despite instruction. 